Nigel is a really special communicator. He's a way of communicating in language that people relate to and understand. Growing up with a dad who teaches others how to parent was mostly pretty normal, except occasionally you get this odd kid who's parents had learned off my dad not to give them so much sugar and they'd always have this grudge against me. He's really creative, he has great ideas and big ideas, he thinks big. Somehow it was my fault that the biscuits were not in his lunchbox anymore. He keeps asking questions. I think he's always looking for what's, what's round the next corner and he won't just stand back and observe it from a distance. He wants to get in and have a go. I think people respond to Nigel's work because he's funny and fun. I swear to God, he's much less funny in person. And it's the way he can communicate complex ideas in this language that just makes sense to people. He doesn't purport to be the super expert on anything. He just presents as someone who's got an insatiable curiosity for life and everything around him. I think most people think their dad's a little bit lame. He has all this passion, he has all this knowledge, and he's a, he's a really good guy that likes to kind of share that and support people. I think Nigel genuinely cares a lot about humanity, and that's what makes him such a warm and funny and engaging and relatable person. He genuinely cares about human beings and how amazing we can possibly be. Please welcome distinguished alumnus Nigel Latter. He'll receive his medallion from Denise Newman. Denise is a recent doctoral graduate and recipient of the Dean's List Award. I'm gonna show the way. Can I just say, <laughs> that's not really your. Son. I've got two kids. <laughs> he was the backup one. <laughs> the good one. He... Yeah, no, he's a good boy, really, isn't he? <laughs> Did you know he was going to say those things? No, I had no idea, no. but he, it, it surprises me not at all. Well, congratulations, anyway. Um, you, you're so well known for so many things. I thought I'd begin by asking you what you're actually doing and what's getting you out of bed these days. So my partner now will be wilting a little bit inside because it does invite a rant. Um, so I'm a little tech startup. I'm making it, we're building a, a parenting app. So I'm, oh, right. yeah, I'm, I'm writing code. Really? Yeah. Yeah, well, we got a clever bloke, Tom. Tom's lovely. <laughs> Tom's like, I'm always looking for Tom's approval. So like, I'll do something and then I'll just find a way to let Tom say, oh, Tom, I, I made a button with a little picture in it. Sounds like quite a good project for a pandemic in some ways, like uh, you wouldn't yeah. have to have gone anywhere. I'm gonna, probably going to ask everyone this, but how have the past two years been for you? Um, forced you to rethink things or change? Or? Uh, uh, yeah, like it's been a bit, it, like everyone, it's been weird uh, and a bit discombobulating. Uh, and it's just been a strange, like the first lockdown was, we were all positive and kind and then mm. we got complacent and... Then the second lockdown just went on, didn't it? It's like, oh, I'm so bored with it. And there was nothing on telly that was interesting anymore. And then we got out, and then those people had their sort of anti-freedom camping protest at Wellington and burnt all their Christmas holiday stuff, didn't they? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you to put a psychologist's hat on, actually. Because it, it strikes me that, you know, it's had this intangible effect on all of us. Yeah. Um, a kind of tiredness, maybe some other mental state, I don't know that any of us have begun to process it properly. Uh, I just wonder what your feelings about it have been. I think it was like variable, I, I think there were lots of different lockdowns. Like I think there were people who had jobs and homes and food and for them it was, you know, they made scones and it was great. And then there were other people and there was like 12 people living in two rooms and it was really, really shit. Um, and so I think for them it was, it was, it was it's like everything, you know? Mm. It's like if you're on the good side of the hill, <laughs> Yes, but even, awesome. I, I sort of feel like even for those of us that were relatively lucky and well, well positioned, we're still um, dealing with something, you know, like I said, intangible, a feeling, a tiredness, a malaise. I, don't know. I think what happened is a lot of us felt like we had some certainty in our lives and, you know, we, we had plans and it, we were fine. And then COVID comes along and it's like, oh, like we don't. Do you know what I mean? Like there's that, everyone's lives turned on a, on a press briefing. Mm. And so... 
it was that level of uncertainty, I think, that was difficult for people. Uh, and it was just long and stressful and difficult. And, um, yeah, it was like, yeah. Do you kind of, you mentioned the Freedom Campers um, from Wellington. <laughs> did you, did you, um, do you attribute some of that to, to, to what happened there? I mean, the disinformation and misinformation that we saw and still seeing, really, how do you explain it? Everybody just wants community. And I think, I think for me, the most telling comment was the people that said, I'm really, like, I'm going to be really sad when this ends because it's like we've found our little village of people. And it's like, I mean, I totally get that. I remember when I was a clinician seeing this kid who was 13 and he was a white supremacist, devil worshipping Satanist. Like him and his friends just used to go and beat up <coughs> kids that didn't look like him. And I just said to him, the Satan part, could you just... Because like, I've watched lots of movies about the devil, and like whenever people team up with him, it goes really bad. And this kid, well, it's true, isn't it? You think, he's not a team player. <laughs> and I said to this kid, what's that about? And do you know what he said? He said, God loves everyone, but for Satan to love you, you have to be special. And it's like, oh, I get it. Like, I get it. Like, here's this kid who's never had anyone who cares about him. Uh, and it's like, well, Satan says, if you're like super evil dude, you're on my side. I mean, yeah. Because the other guy, well, oh, I love everyone. I can see why you've made a really good career out of <laughs> psychology, <clears throat> not, if not theology. Um, <laughs> yeah, they don't. <laughs> the Pope doesn't come to me for comment. I did, I did get... We went on a family holiday once and I got super grumpy at the Sistine Chapel because we were standing there in the Sistine Chapel and like they had their shush police, right? And they've got their dusty old painting and people would talk too loud and they'd all go, shh. And I just got really angry because I thought, oh yeah, cool, 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 cool. So basically, you've got shush police that you can put around the place in case we talk too loud and, I don't know, disturb your dusty old painting, but you pretty much ship pedophiles around the planet for frickin' decades. <coughs> like, what's that about? Well, it's definitely why the Pope's not calling you. Um, he's probably also not calling you because you actually are a scientist and you began with zoology and marine science and then you switched to psychology. Yeah. Do you remember what, uh, what was going on when you, when you made that switch? Yeah, so like, as a kid I used to watch Jacques Cousteau on the telly and I thought, oh, I want to be a marine scientist. And then I discovered science is actually quite, it's quite, like it's not just swanning about in boats looking at seals, it's quite hard. Um, yeah. And I thought, yeah, that's, and it was back in the day when it was basically free, right? So I could, I could swan about and do all sorts of different things. And so at the end of that, I had to decide what to do, and then I, I sort of pivoted back to psychology. Um, I guess you didn't, assume or realise at the time that you might become something of a celebrity because of this life well, it's, I mean, choice? The thing is, in New Zealand, there's, what, five million of us? Being a celebrity in New Zealand is like being in a community newspaper in Sydney. Do you know what I mean? It's like so... <laughs> Don't be so modest. <laughs> no, it's not. Like, it really isn't. And so, like, occasionally I've seen a couple of telly people at things, and they're quite full of themselves, and I just think, come on. Hmm. You're in, like, the Sydney South Morning Herald. Let's... Let's get a grip. You sure this isn't just a way of deflecting from the fact that you're a very needy person and you <laughs> like applause? Well, and the strange thing is, actually, like I'm the, the, the being on telly part of it is the part that I enjoy the least. Like I think, the, and of all of it, being on telly in and of itself is actually a kind of a vacuous and empty thing, right? Like the, that, that part of it isn't. But the stuff that I enjoy the most is A, the people that I work with, because I've been lucky to work with really great people. And also you can do things that are meaningful and important. So we made a documentary about suicide, and I remember afterwards this bloke, that I've known him for years, he came, this big, quite manly bloke, he'd come up to me, and he just gave me this great big hug. Um, quite a strong hug, quite a crushing hug. Um, <laughs> And he just talked about how he was feeling really depressed at home so, and like was having those kind of thoughts and he watched this documentary uh, and, it, and, it, and it really helped him. But again, that wasn't me. Like there was a, a, a bunch of us worked. Like TV is a, as you know, like it's a, it's a team Ooh. pursuit. And so if you're the presenter, you're often the person who gets all the credit. But all of that stuff is just because I work with great people that really give a monkeys about the stuff that they're doing. Well, one of the things you, di you did on TV, it's probably when I really first noticed your work was the Beyond the Darklands stuff, which, yeah. you know, like its name, takes you to some pretty dark places. What draws you to that subject in the first place? I mean, for, 
to begin with, it was all parenting and, you know, it was quite the opposite. Yeah, so I sort of, in my clinical career, I kind of did both side by side, like the working with kids and families and doing the forensic stuff. Um, but the forensic stuff, I guess what interests me about it is, um, so I grew up on the east coast of the South Island, and I'd like a, in a really normal family, with, and my mum's here, out there somewhere, like with a great mum and dad, and I grew up just thinking that was how life was for everyone. And then you kind of grow up a bit and you go, ah, oh, like, that wasn't what it was like for everyone. And so um, I just kind of got curious about the other stuff. Like, you know that whole two paths, the diver like if, if there was an actual wood and there were two paths and they said, look, go that way, mm. it's paved, there's a little cafe, it's easy. Don't go down there, there's some fucked up shit down there. I would totally, totally <coughs> want to go down that other one. Because like you get to be alive once, uh, and so I kind of thought, so what are people like that do that kind of stuff? And what I discovered is they're just they're just people. They're just people. Mm. It's just all they are. Like they're actually more like me than they are not like me. I mean, this spills over into your real world work as well, like in prisons and with social services. Um, obviously, gives you some in insight into you know aspects of New Zealand life and society that we perhaps don't talk about enough. Are you a pessimist as the re as a result of that work? Or no, not? I'm a huge optimist. Like I've seen I've seen kids who have um, just had the most horrific upbringings, and they sort themselves out. You know, you t I, I remember once the first. I remember once sitting in this house, and the guy was. I've seen a few interesting. This guy was like he was all mongrel mob. He was like full mongrel mob, not like just part. He was like full, and he was like he the thing <laughs> and his <laughs> tattoos and all that kind of stuff. Um, <coughs> And there was a big dog thing up on the wall, but it was just before Christmas. There's also a Christmas tree. And we were sitting there talking about his daughter, who was 13 and wasn't going to school. And he was just this dad mm -hmm. worried about his kid. No, I, I'm really optimistic, because actually most people are amazing. And, and, and I've seen people come through all sorts of terrible stuff. And resilience for some people, like just the fact that some people get out of bed is pretty, in the morning is pretty freaking amazing, given the stuff they've been through. Um, last year, when I was talking with Ashley Bloomfield on this stage, you know, I asked him what he thought the biggest challenge facing the country was, and he said entrenched poverty and the wealth gap. So I, I wanted to put that question to you. What, what do you think is, what would you say? I think it's the fact that we're just humans and useless. It's going to be quite hard to like, overcome that one. You know, but it's like, and what I mean by that is kind of, like we know, well, like we know that stuff, and so like we've made docos on equality and all that kind of stuff, and these are like these are our big issues. But the problem is, it's really hard to be a human on the world and 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 do stuff about that because most people are just trying to pay their mortgage and and feed their kids and try to figure out what the hell they're doing with their life, and it's really hard to stay connected to all of those people whose lives are very different to our own. So I think kind of an indifference brought about by busyness is the biggest problem that we face. Because whenever you actually put people in rooms with people, they care. I remember once we did this thing, it never made telly, but we got this guy who was, um, it was just about what happens when you bring, we, we got this guy, he had been unemployed for three years, and we interviewed him and he said his thing. And we got a woman, and she was the, um, some high up in the ACT party, and she was all like, oh yeah, the poor are awful, and they, uh, lazy, and uh, all that kind of stuff. And then we got them together, and um, we got them together, and they just started uh, chatting, and like, and they quite genuinely over the course of the film and everything, like, they developed more of an understanding about who the uh, the other person was and stuff. And so, like, whenever you actually get humans together, because that's what we've done for the last hundred and twenty thousand years, like, we kind of want to be with other people, and we want to be teams, and we want to kind of help each other out. Um, it's just that we become distanced, and we become busy and lives become too separate and so people don't understand the lives of a lot of the people they criticise and it's like well go and hang out with them a bit and you might yeah, change I mean, how you think. Yeah it's sort of an argument for um, bigger imaginations really isn't it? Yeah just don't listen to news talk ZB and <laughs> <coughs> I did I was in a taxi once and Mike Hosking was on the Mike Hosking Mike Hosking, he was on the, he was on the radio, and he's, I'm sure Mike's a lovely, I haven't met him, but he's a lovely man. And he said, he said, do you know what? He said, do you know the thing that people don't understand about poverty? He said, the thing that people don't understand about poverty, he said, poverty's not about money. Poverty's about mindset. I remember sitting there thinking, I think it's a little bit to do with money. Yeah. Like, I think... <laughs> <laughs> I think there's a good point. I don't think people living in poverty have got stacks of cash. They go, you know what, I'm just, I don't know, I'm just against it. Yeah. In principle. 
<laughs> so I'm just going to sit here in a damp mouldy house and uh, be hungry. I'd quite like to sit here for longer and, um, you know, do some media criticism. <laughs> um, but where would we stop? Um, <laughs> Let's bring it back to the here and now. You've yeah. had a few accolades in your time, and you know, you're fairly well known. How's it felt being drawn back to the old university this time? What's it meant to you? What's it made you think? How old I am? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I know like, that one. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's strange, really. I mean, um, I, I, to be honest, like, get, like, this, is, this is nice, but I, like, I look at things like this and I think literally everything I've done in my life has been because I've been part of teams of people. And it's like, and it's not, it's, it totally isn't false modesty. It's like if I have a skill, I think, it's like finding good people and bringing people together in teams because um, nothing, I've, I've done nothing of any worth by myself. Like books, you don't write books by yourself. Like you write books because, you know, you've got a family that supports you to write those books in the first place. You've got a difficult kid who's like, Oh, what do we do with this one? I don't know. Um, <coughs> you, you're published leaders. T Tally's a team sport. My clinical stuff was a team stuff. Like you're working with families, you're working with other people. So, so I like I, and it's not false modesty. I just think anyone who thinks they do things because they got there themselves, you're just an egotistical idiot. Like you didn't. You got there because you work with other people. Like that's the uh, the big thing. So, yeah. I mean, the university thing was kind of where I started, but I pretty much from the get go, I started working with. Just some really great people. And it was people I met because of the stuff I was doing at Auckland University in the clinical program. So, you know, it was the, um, it was a launch pad into a whole bunch of stuff for me. Well, thanks for taking one for the team, Nigel. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, Nigel Lapper. Thank you.